Welcome to another live stream uh, on the Code Mental channel. Uh, so today I'm going to continue a Python course I started on Kaggle and so far I've done three models and today the, the episode is going to be on lists. Lists in Python represent are represented by order sequence of values. Here is an example of how to create them. Primes equal square brackets two, three, five, seven, and then empty, close square bracket. No surprises there. So this first example is numbers, integers, now we have another example with strings, planets equal to Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and so on. And we can create a list of lists. So I can have a list inside a list. In this case, we have three lists inside one bigger list. Something I didn't know before. Come after the last element is the option. Okay, some languages allow you to have a comma even if there's no element after, and Python is one of them. Just to simplify things, you know, sometimes it can be convenient when you're building up a string or something. So the first example we see here is for readability, and here they show an example where you put everything in the same line. So another thing that uh, Python has, and this can be confusing, is that unlike other programming languages, like Java for instance, there is a, um, a strict, there is no like, you can put anything you want in a list really. Like you can put a number here, and you have a string, and you have a variable as well, which uh, probably points to, oh, it's a function actually. So it, uh, the function help itself. You can pass in a function as an, a parameter or, a, or a, an element, just like any other data type. So uh, the next section is talking about index indices. So if you create a list, then you can reference elements in that list with uh, an integer. Normally, well, always, almost always, it starts with the, the first element of a list is zero. Element zero, planets was defined here, and you can see the first element of planets is Mercury, and that's, sorry, uh, and that's actually index zero. Then the next one is Venus. Okay, slicing. Oh, one thing is interesting here, before I go into slicing. So if you use a negative number, then you're actually going to get elements from the end of the list rather than the start of the list. So there's no minus zero because minus zero is zero, so it starts with minus one. So the last element is minus one. And you can see here, Neptune is the last element. Slicing. Slicing is basically an operation you can do in Python to take a subset of the elements, in this case of a list. So zero to three, including zero, excluding three. So zero, one, two. In this list, Index is, this is index two, so it would take the whole list. So if you don't specify zero as a, uh, the starting element, then it, it defaults to zero. So this is why you can have this short notation, which kind of means the same thing as this notation above. Right, so... So the same thing for the end of the list. So if you don't specify For example, like uh, imagine you have a list of 10 elements, right? And you you want to index 3 to 9, which means the it's basically done. the reminder of the list. But in this case, because 9 is the last element of the list, you don't need to specify it. So this means just takes take whatever elements in a list are after index 3. Which if we check here in the original list, 0, 1, 2, 3. So 3 up to the end. And you can see. See the result here? Well, it gets a bit confusing here. I don't think many people use this notation. I haven't seen it very often. But so we omit a zero, which is the first element of the list, and we're using minus one, which earlier before we saw that minus one is to refer to the last element of the list. But because you know, as we saw earlier, this is the start element, including that element. And this is the end element, but excluding that element. So, but uh, it's the same concept, right? You're just saying, what is my start element, right? And you just say, I want the third last planet to be my starting element. And if you go to the list, one, two, three, yeah, this is it. I, I'm not a big fan of this type of notations, right? They look cool on paper, but when you're actually in the real world, uh, trying to uh, uh, read someone else's code, this person is going to be, um, kind of hated for writing code like that because you know even though it it looks very smart the truth is nobody 
like it. So if you want to be popular in your place, don't try to do <laughs> don't try to use these kind of conditions. This is basically called obfuscating code, right? Because I mean, I really have to. I need to think for a minute, uh, say, to understand what this is trying to do. But then, if you really want the the last three elements, then this is a way to do it. So next one. So this is a concept of mutability, right? And I can maybe start giving an example of a functional language. A pure functional language, like, um, I'll give an example of Haskell because that's something I learned before. They normally treat uh, return types as types as immutable. So a list in Haskell is immutable. What that means is that you can't change that list. So immutable means it can't change. Mutable means it can change, which is obviously of cannot. So if you send me a list, a variable with a list, I can modify that list directly. If it was immutable, I wouldn't be able to modify that list directly. I would have to create a new list with my modifications and return that list. And here it shows you how you can modify that list. This is very common to do. So basically, this notation is telling me, is basically saying to the computer, to the Python interpreter, replace for me, please, the fourth element counting from the start of the list with this string. And the result is this. This Python notation we can also do even more difficult things. Like, so this notation is, as we saw earlier, this means elements 0, 2, excluding 3, right? So the range between 0 and 3, excluding 3. So 0, 1, 2. And then I'm assigning at the same time, I'm replacing those three elements with this here. I'm reversing what I've just done. But instead of using, of doing, to, uh, basically overriding the first three elements in a list, we're doing we are writing the first four elements in a list. So list functions are functions that apply to lists and they give you some extra, uh, some information. Len is one example of a function you probably use, you will definitely, if you do Python, you will use it a lot. Uh, and this length will calculate the size of the list. Sorted means is to basically sort by alphabetical order, which is a default. And I'm, I'm sure if I looked at this will have options to basically change the way you sort it. But here it doesn't talk about that. Primes. So you can apply, basically if you want to add up all the elements in the, in the list, you can use sum of primes. So sum takes as a, a parameter a list and returns a sum, the total. I can also pass, use uh, some other functions that we've used before, like min. So for example, if I use min on a list of primes, on that list here, this is going to give me the list well, this is max, but if I wanted the minimum, it's like min, and that's going to give me two. If I want to do the max, it's going to give me seven. Everything in Python is an object, and uh, even if we're talking about primitive data types like an integer, a float, or something like that, like this. So what are primitive data types? Uh, those are the numbers that, those are the data types that you would normally see in in the actual uh, hardware itself, you know, at the hardware level, you'll have some data types which are native to the to the machine. So an integer is an example because everything in a computer is represented as, as binary. So creating a number, you don't really need much more than like an address in memory, one or two bytes. So, but uh, because in Python it's not like that anyway. They everything's an object. An object carries extra information, and an example here they, they give is a variable that you can find in any number, which uh, is emac, emac, which is um, the imaginary part. You, you don't normally need to use it, but it's there. And the advantage of having everything represented as an object is that you are able afterwards to apply the same type of operations to any data type, really. So an example of, of that is like we saw just now, you can do you can apply max to a list. Um, we, we use the mean and max with a list of arguments rather than a, an actual list. So that's why having everything as an object makes things easier in terms of reusing functions. x equal to 12, this is an object, right? An integer, 12. But then the integer has a property called emac and that holds uh, information about the imaginary part, right? Which is zero in this case for 12. Now, 
here we are talking about complex number and then the integer part is so 12 plus 3j and then so the the real the imag in this case will be three and the good thing about functions uh, objects right is that because everything is a, a, an, an object right you can actually just attach some methods onto it which means you can actually call some operations on those objects and some quite often you'll find that there are out of the box you know default operations that you can call and that you know you, well when i say operations i'm talking about methods so there's a difference between a method and an attribute so think of an attribute as just some information that's there in this case for example emag is just the it's the imaginary number right a method is code it doesn't hold any information but it can it can give you basically a method will derive information from that object normally that's what it does so this is another example of a method that you'll find on uh, a number if i'm not mistaken bit length is the number of bits but let me just look it up so and that's how what i always do when i don't know something try to look in the documentation okay so this is interesting right so i actually mentioned earlier on that each number well everything in a computer is represented by binary and what is binary binary is a series of zeros and one a zero and one is basically called a bit this method basically what it does it tells you how many bits you need to represent the number they stored in that object. And this can vary, right? Because if I have a small number, it's going to be a small number of bits. If I have a big number, it's going to be a higher number of bits. And another thing I can add here, that in a computer itself, we normally allocate the number of bits beforehand anyway. So even if, if it's a small number and it only takes like, what, four bits? So objects is everywhere, um, methods are everywhere, and many times you call them without really realizing, because uh, there's some syntax syntactic sugar in Python, which tries to make things a bit nicer and better looking, let's say. That's why they call it syntactic uh, sugar. But then it can also hide some of the implementation details. So it's so far it has been an excellent course. So in lists, actually, there's, you're going to be using lists all the time. So many of the methods that are available in list, they are worth learning. Append, adding something to the list, to the end. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, point here. We discussed earlier on about the fact that we are working with mutable lists. A mutable list is a list that you can change directly. So it makes sense that when you change a, a mutable list here, you don't need to you don't have any any result you don't have any output because you're changing planets directly right? if it was an immutable list which is the opposite of mutable then you would have to receive this method would have to return something and when something doesn't return anything uh, in python you always get none here we talk about some other useful methods and you will see pop come up push and pop it's normally a method that you'll see on a queue Push means add something and pop means remove something. And it's coming from, you know, like from the last thing you added. It's a queue. So in here, pop, I take the last element from the list and return it. And you'll see it returns Pluto and then it removes Pluto from this list, which should return, which is here. 
Another useful method is when you're searching for something inside the list and you know it's there. Or maybe you don't know, sometimes you might not know. So it will give you, if you use dot index, it will tell you the index where it found the element that you're looking for, which is 2. So 0, 1, 2, remember, it's always like that. So if we wanted to do a search for Pluto, index Pluto, that would be... Because we just removed it, right? It would give you an error, like it's showing here. Anyway, you can deal with this error with an exception, like a try and catch. But... If you don't want to have any error, you can also use... You can do a test beforehand, right? So you check first that it, the element is inside the list, and then you could use something like an if statement, which we learned in the previous lesson. So it's interesting. If you want to know what methods are available for a particular object, you can use help with the object itself. But this can help you in different ways, right? First of all, it can tell you what it is, which sometimes you don't know because uh, in the, the problem with Python is, or the, the feature of Python is that nothing is, um, like the data type doesn't, gets only assigned the first time you assign something to it. And you can change over time. Tuples. They are similar to lists, however, there's some difference. First one you notice is instead of square brackets, we use we use parentheses. And we don't even have to always use parentheses to create a tuple. If you omit the parentheses, it's still considered a tuple, as it shows here in this example. Oh, and remember I talked about mutable and immutable? The biggest difference between a, a tuple and a list is that the tuple is immutable, so you can't change it. And here it gives you an example if you try to change it. So it says, tuple does not accept item assigned. And tuples are often used for functions that have multiple return values. And I will just give you a very practical explanation of that. Sometimes you want to return more than one thing at the same time because whatever you're doing needs to return more than one thing. Let's say you, you want to return an integer as your return value and you also want to return a string like a description of what happened. That could be a, an error message or something. Just one example I can give you. Of course, you could also use an object, but sometimes it's more convenient to just do it, use tuples, you know, saves you from defining a, a, a class. And a nice thing is when you know you're going to receive a tuple in a function, you can store, for example, if you know it's a, a tuple with two elements, then you can store the two elements in this type of notation, do whatever you need to do with it. And I would never do this, to be honest. And I think many people will never do this, but this is nice to know that you, it's a trick. That's why they call it stupid. So you can swap two variables using this notation, which basically, this is a tuple, and you're just reassigning the values using the notation itself. All right, so the next thing is going to be a code challenge. I'm just going to put the link on the description below, and uh, then you can give it, give it a go. Thanks so much for watching, and have a good evening.